On behalf of the Middle East Institute, I welcome you all to a very special event. We're very honored and pleased to be hosting uh, His Excellency Ambassador Murat Dutem, uh, who will be talking to us about the role of humanitarian efforts in Turkish foreign policy. And uh, after 45 minutes uh, or so, it will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, we really look forward to that uh, section as well. Uh, before I leave the floor to him, a uh, few words on his uh, background, very quick. His Excellency Ambassador Murat Lutem began his uh, career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1993. He was appointed to the embassies of Bonn, Baku, and Washington, and served as the Boston Consul General from 2010 to 2013. Ambassador Lutem, who served twice in the office of the President of Turkey during his appointments in Ankara, was the advisor to the Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs during his last appointment in Ankara from 2013 to 2016. Ambassador Lutem graduated from the Middle East Technical University, Department of International Relations, and was a fellow of the Weatherhead Center at Harvard University from 2010 to 2018. 11. So without further ado, I leave the floor to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words of introduction, Dr. Yolachan. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. I appreciate the invitation. Um, this is an opportunity for me to reach out to you um, as the Ambassador of the Republic of Turkey, but it's always good to meet with um, academia, um, students, scholars, and especially it's a particular challenge that I welcome um, when they are uh, of the caliber that I know uh, I'm facing here uh, at such a um, select university that ranks so very highly globally. Um, I will try to conclude, uh, go through and conclude my remarks in the 40 to maybe 45 minutes so that we do have time for questions that you may have. And um, I'll start without delay. I want to take a few minutes um, just maybe to go into uh, the basics of Turkish foreign policy before I go on into the actual topic at hand. Uh, I'm not sure of how many of you know much about Turkish foreign policy. Is there anybody here except for you, sir, who've ever been to Turkey before? Oh my god, everybody's been. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, well, those of you who have been um, will know much of this. Uh, Turkey is, is, a, is a country suspended between east and west um, with um, a leg in uh, the continent of Europe and a larger a portion of its uh, existence, uh, a leg in um, Asia, uh, a nation of 80 million plus um, citizens, uh, a, a per capita income of about uh, $10,500, uh, the world's 16th largest economy, sixth in Europe. Uh, just yesterday, well, the day before, we celebrated the 95th anniversary of the creation of the uh, Republic by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, um, a visionary statesman and um, genius military leader who created the modern republic. But of course, before that, again, those of you who do know about Turkey will probably know that um, uh, there was the Ottoman Empire, to which the, uh, the Turkish Republic today is a successor state to, which lasted about a little over 600 years. And um, depending on when you look at it, uh, in which phase of its existence you look at it, uh, was the dominating power in much of the region, um, North Africa, all the Middle East, uh, Arabian Peninsula, um, almost all of, I guess, uh, well, the Balkans for sure, and uh, much of Eastern Europe as, at its zenith. Um, so a very multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural, widely spread um, internationally, uh, I guess, international um, identity holding empire collapsed with, this, with the First World War. Um, and from that, again, with um, the work of Atatürk and his supporters, the modern Republic of Turkey that we celebrated in the 95th year was born. Um, Turkey today is a NATO member. It's a democracy. It has um, aspirations to join the European Union. We have difficulties there, but it's certainly a Western-oriented country. However, when I say Western-oriented country, it's also important to understand that uh, it has its own foreign policy because it has its own um, international standing, it has its own concerns, and it has its own neighborhood. 
uh, these bring about the realities that we have to contend with and uh, according to which we have to shape our foreign policy. We are in a fairly difficult region of the world, um, it, especially now, of course, it's in the news continuously, Syria, uh, as it's been unfolding in the last six or seven years, is right next door to us. We share a very long border with Syria uh, and with Iraq, um, so security is always an issue. Um, beyond that, our close and important neighbors are Russia, um, Iran, but of course we're also neighbors with um, Armenia, there's a fly that's taken a keen interest in me, excuse me, um, with Armenia, um, also with Bulgaria, and on the west side also with uh, Greece. So a very strategic and central location. I would say that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's a Western, of course, oriented country, uh, but uh, also we have, especially, I would say, as of maybe uh, the last two decades, a strong um, interest, leaning, and involvement with our East. This needs to be because, as I mentioned at the outset, um, if you're a country that's a bridge country, suspended between East and West, only looking to one direction does not give you a complete view. It does not give you a complete spectrum of the realities around you, nor does it give you access to all the opportunities that your country has, nor are you facing all the challenges properly that you do face um, when you have the sort of reality that we do. Um, as the economy grew and uh, reached a certain level at which we're at uh, in the 2000s, Turkey started to look more towards its east as well. This is important to know. Our involvement uh, with, for example, security operations in Syria are a direct reality of what's transpiring in Syria. Turkey, I think, uh, is the one, well, definitely West Bloc nation that had strong presence of boots on the ground in the fight against ISIS which is now pretty much done. Um, but uh, who knows what the next challenge is. When um, the instability and the war in Iraq occurred, it affected us directly. Um, the brutal, brutal policies of the Syrian regime and towards its own people, and we'll come to that in a minute, um, the direct reflection on Turkey when we talk about the uh, 3.6 million Syrians who've sheltered in Turkey, that has a direct relation and a direct consequence on Turkey. So we cannot avoid these realities, and we don't. Um, the, the Turkish foreign policy perspective that I'm trying to give you, I think I'll end it with this. Um, we do work for peace and stability. It's in our direct interest as well as in the interest of the people um, around us, the nations around us. But we do so not just purely with a national interest perspective in mind, which is definitely true for us as well as for all nations. All nations have to tend to their national interest. But we also do that with um, a moral context to it. Because at the end of the day, I believe, um, this is my personal opinion, but I think I, I speak um, quite accurately when I speak about this being the basic tenet of Turkish foreign policy. At the end of the day, if you don't have a moral backdrop, a pillar to rest against, only guiding yourself through what you consider to be the best interest of your nation and ignoring other realities does not yield fruitful results, at least not in the mid to long term. So the moral aspect is important too. And that's what we um, always return to when we do our calculations. You know, we'll just stand up to a moral sort of um, uh, yardstick. Now, Coming to the topic at hand, um, humanitarian aid and its role in Turkish foreign policy. Let's talk about humanitarian aid. Um, many of you may not have known, it's not widely known, but I'm very proud to, uh, to, to say this here. Turkey is the world's number one supplier of humanitarian aid, period. Um, this, is, this is according to the data of 2017, and I'll, I don't want to make this a data-specific presentation, and I was speaking to some of the students here while we were just um, starting off. There's nothing behind us here except for what you're seeing and you'll be seeing for the remainder of the presentation, and that's intentional. It's intentional because if I go on and on about data-specific input about where we have uh, you know, polio vaccination campaigns in the world and, and where we have soup kitchens and where we're rebuilding um, bridges and schools, while that's important in itself for sure, that's too technical for what I want to achieve here today, and that's to talk about a broader picture. But I do have to go into some data to give you some context, so here it goes. 
We are the number one nation in supplying humanitarian aid. Uh, the data for 2017, um, this is not Turkish data, it's international organization data, states that we have um, committed 8.07, almost 8.1 billion US dollars to humanitarian aid operations globally and in Turkey. Our closest, um, well, our friend and ally, our closest uh, um, ranking nation uh, right after us is the United States with 6.6 .6 billion. Germany comes in at 2.9 billion. The UK at 2.5 billion. And numerous EU organizations, it's stated in the data, 2.2 um, billion. So that's sort of the ranking. I believe that's impressive and I think that's something to be proud of. Beyond that, it gets, I think, even more um, uh, inspiring if you do the math according to GDP, because in that case, Turkey is giving 0 0.85, so close to 1% of its GDP to humanitarian aid operations. Um, the number two nation after Turkey with 0 0.85 is Norway with 0 0.17. Now, this is a huge contribution, and I want to go back to what I was saying at the outset. We are a nation with a per capita income of about 10,500 US dollars. That puts us in sort of a middle income category country. Yes, the 16th largest economy in the world, but 16th, not sixth, and not first or second. We are a G20 country, um, but in many analysis, you would still find that Turkey is being considered as an emerging market economy. And we do have economic fluctuations from time to time, as we're experiencing this year as well. So I think that puts in a, 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 uh, things into more of a perspective as to how much Turkey is actually giving. Why? Why? You know, I mean, there has to be a reason for this. And when I was working towards putting together a, a hopefully coherent um, presentation, it was a big question for me, because the data is out there, and they're all in points of, you know, of order that are easy to access. They're everywhere on the internet, but why? And I won't come to why until I give you a little bit more data. And that'll be the end of the data, pretty much. Uh, the first point I want to come to is the Turkish agencies involved in supplying this humanitarian aid. And there it's important to understand one thing. Humanitarian aid, um, it's a bit of a technical differentiation. Humanitarian aid is not the exact same thing as development aid. Um, if you have to think about it in, or this is the way I try to keep it in mind, humanitarian aid is, is, is what you do when there's a fire. Development aid is what you do to prevent a fire or to rebuild after the fire. Different agencies do different things. And this 8.1 billion covers both. But it, the statistics are true for all nations, so the ranking doesn't change that Turkey is number one. The Turkish Red Crescent is the major disaster relief and humanitarian aid organization of Turkey. Of course, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, they're sister organizations. Um, we just had the deputy director of the Red uh, Crescent here. He was at the, uh, an international conference organized by the Singaporean Red Cross, and they work very extensively together. So that is the one uh, agency that comes into mind first when, it, when it's humanitarian aid. However, they work hand in hand with, in our case, the Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency. Um, they supply more development aid. And then um, there's a third, these are all Turk government institutions. There's a third institution called AFAD, uh, which is um, a disaster relief agency created only in 2009 also supplies, assists with humanitarian aid, but is geared towards mostly working inside Turkey. The other two institutions work inside Turkey as well as abroad. Um, these three principal organizations are then assisted in Turkey uh, by a host of um, civilian humanitarian aid organizations. Uh, and these are guided by altruistic uh, beliefs. Some are religiously based, some are just um, out of so social consciousness and, and you know, being good citizens. And they also supply humanitarian aid. Then um, there are international organizations to which Turkey contributes and uh, in which uh, 
operations of these institutions, Turkey uh, takes part in. These are mostly UN institutions. These also supply humanitarian aid. So there's a, a, a variety of avenues through which this aid and, and this assistance comes in. That would be the sort of the, the skeleton of, of, of the, how this aid comes through um, in the sense of its uh, different outlets. Uh, where does Turkey do what? This is an endless ocean of data, which I'm not putting up uh, on the screen behind you, but I'm going to go through it really quickly because it gives you a sense of how widely spread this $8.1 billion um, uh, volume of assistance is. Um, of course, the Syrians in Turkey <laughs> Um, the, the, Syri the Syrians in Turkey takes up a, a great portion of this effort um, and the funds involved. I had a slightly difficult time in exactly establishing how much of this $8.1 billion goes to our Syrian um, guests. Um, 3.6 million Syrians we have as of, I think, uh, July, the data, in Turkey. And I'm going to come back to them. Uh, my understanding is that a little over half of the $8 billion in 2017 went directly to the Syrians, around close, closer to five. But elsewhere in the world, uh, where does Turkey operate? Where does this humanitarian aid uh, go to? I'll go through it really quickly. Nigeria, Chad, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Mozambique in Africa, Colombia in Latin America recently, in Europe, we have Romania, Moldova, Albania, Georgia. Uh, going on down to the Middle East, we have uh, Iraq, of course, Palestine, Yemen. Um, more towards, in our part of the world, Vietnam, Japan after the uh, tsunami and the earthquake. And most recently, very recently, uh, in Indonesia. Cox's Bazar, uh, the Rohingya there, is also a specific case. Um, there, because I just spoke to the director, deputy director general of um, the Red Crescent, there the, the operation is, is, is massive. Um, it's for food, medical assistance, shelter. They're building and have built a tent city in Cox's Bazaar. A good portion of that comes directly from the Turkish Red Crescent. Um, there is a field hospital and 25,000 people are fed with the warm meals daily, 25,000. Of course, I think the, the total population that had to flee is closer to 800,000. And there are many other, I, I should say this, I mean, I'm not claiming that Turkey is the exclusive and only supplier of humanitarian aid in the world. That's definitely not the case. There are many that are working. Um, we're just the, 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 the one with the largest contribution. So after that, Bit, I want to go back to the initial question. Why? Two reasons that this is my understanding of it uh, after reading up on it. The first is uh, one out of risk necessity. Um, you might want to call it realpolitik, those of you who are students, scholars of international politics or politics. Uh, and that, of course, ties in directly with the first and largest. Um, portion of this aid that has to go to the Syrians in Turkey, the 3.6 million that had to flee the violence in Syria. Uh, it's a necessity because had, had we not taken up and continue to take up these Syrian neighbors of ours who are fleeing this violence, we have to understand that not taking them in for us, for the Europeans it's a little different, we'll come to that, but for us not taking them in is condemning them to whatever they face. And for a good number of them, it would be death. For many others, it would definitely be um, destitute, illness, starvation, um, human misery that is very difficult to envision from where we are today. But we are neighbors with Syria, and we see footage, and we, we, we see coverage, and we hear stories from people who come in that much of the world doesn't see because it's not something that you can show on primetime TV or pretty much anywhere else. And, and, and the reality is that, uh, my understanding and my sense is that after so many years, six, seven years of, of this tragedy unfolding, you know, the, the, the general 
public member thinks of something that's happening in Syria as to be a tragedy that's happening and it's bad and it needs to be solved and, and, and there you go, that's it. But it's not like that for us. Um, first of all, there's a human responsibility and secondly, there's an absolute necessity. We have to address this. Um, when a European nation does not take in a Syrian refugee, what they do is they send them back. This is the norm, by the way. It's not the Europeans being nasty. They send them back to the country of origin. That's the way it's done. The country of origin is wherever they last got on a boat, on a plane, or whatever. That's unlikely to be Syria. It could be, I don't know, Turkey. It could be Greece. It could be somewhere. But they can then rest assured that they've only sent them to, to Greece, to Turkey, to wherever. If we don't take a Syrian in, we know they're going to die or they're going to have um, to suffer through this inhumane reality that many Syrians are now facing because of what the regime is doing. <coughs> uh, I was speaking about the moral aspect. Um, if, if you have any leaning towards guiding yourself through moral values, you cannot let these people die. Beyond that, there is, of course, the realpolitik part of, uh, of it. Um, Stability and security, always an issue for Turkey. We have to, we have to watch out. And um, we can't allow Syria to destabilize us. And not taking in these refugees, well, not refugees, but not taking in these people who are fleeing for their lives. Um, at the end of the day, it's also something that we cannot um, properly, uh, I don't know how to format this, not taking them in would also not, not be a realistic way of looking at uh, how to address security concerns. You leave them there, many will want to come in anyway. And, and taking them in and managing the problem is better than letting the problem fester and then get out of hand. Um, we have international humanitarian law requirements by which we direct our policy. And we have to let them in according to those requirements as well. Turkey as the world, well, NATO's second largest standing army is the Turkish army. If we were, for some reason, um, leaning towards not letting them in, we have the means of doing that. But it's not moral, it's not good policy, and at the end of the day, uh, it can't be, you, you, can't, you can't account for what you do if that's the policy to follow. It looks good at the beginning, maybe, if you don't let in people who, who, who come in in such huge numbers. But at the end of the day, you know, I know this sounds corny, but how do you look at yourself in the mirror? And then when the reality overwhelms you anyway, you have to deal with it at a time where you cannot anymore give shape to it. You cannot control it. So uh, as I said, necessity is definitely a part of, of what we're doing. Now, um, over the, the statistics, again, uh, are very difficult to completely break down mathematically because it stretches over six, seven years. But uh, we have spent about $33 billion on, on, on the Syrians in Turkey with the out, from the very initial outset of the first, um, first Syrians coming into Turkey. And it's grown, and it's grown, and it's grown, and we're at 3.6 billion now. There are over 4 million foreigners in Turkey who fled for their lives, uh, for their well-being. So, so there are some Iraqis as well, as well as some some others from other nations, but uh, the overwhelming majority, as I stated, are, are, are the Syrians. Um, of this $30 billion, uh, I don't mind saying that only 600 million has come from the UN and 850 million has come from the EU. So I don't think we're being um, treated fairly when it comes to burden sharing, but it's a reality and that's not gonna stop us from taking them in. We do hope that the Syrians, once the, uh, we do hope that the, the, the problem in Syria is resolved and the intention, of course, is, our intention is to have all these Syrians go back to Syria, to their motherland. Now, the second reason, after necessity and the reality of it, is, is what I call the moral aspect. Now, I was talking about morals. Um, the Turkish society, why, why, why do we give? Why, why the $8.1 billion? Why is Turkey number one in supplying humanitarian aid? Uh, because there is a moral aspect to it. It's about, it's, it, and, and there are a couple, I think, uh, uh, aspects to it that I want to address shortly. It's not just one. Uh, the, the important thing to know is that an overwhelming majority of this um, humanitarian aid supplied, especially by the Turkish Red Crescent, actually is funded directly by individual donations. 
So it's not the state only giving for various reasons, it's actually Turkish citizens giving. Why? So here are the, some of the reasons that come to mind. Uh, I think the we remember factor is important for Turks. And we remember the shattering of the Ottoman Empire, which was accompanied, as, as usually the breakdown of empires goes, with um, massive displacement, human suffering, famine, sickness. Um, many of the Ottoman subjects, as the empire was contracting, having to flee for their lives, um, come into the Anatolian heartland, which is essentially what Turkey is, is today. Uh, um, this, this didn't happen 300 years ago. It didn't happen, t well, t some of it happened maybe 150 years ago or so, but it didn't happen so long ago that it's a memory long lost and you only read about in the history books. Part of my family, family came from Crete in the 1890s. That's not that long ago, 1890. Um, it's certainly not so long ago that there's no um, recollection of it. You know, my great-great-grandfather knew about it. He came in, uh, he told his child, and, and it's been handed down. Uh, this is true for many Turks. So that memory is strong, and uh, the understanding of what that sort of misery means is omnipresent in, in many Turks today. Then there are other factors. Uh, the reality of kinship ties, an affinity to those that we think are no are Turkish or of Turkish descent, uh, plays a huge factor. So the Balkans, Central Asia, Caucasus, certain communities in the Middle East have very close ties with Turkey and some of them have Turkish ancestry. That's another reason why I think Turkey and the Turkish people give. Beyond that, however, it's not just about um, kinship ties. There are other reasons. Um, what I'll call religious and um, purely moral, I guess, maybe might be a definition. Cox's Bazaar, we just talked about. They're not Turkish, never former Ottoman territory, um, but they're Muslims, right? suffering a tragedy, and of course in the Muslim faith, as there is in, I think, all, all faiths uh, a responsibility to help your brother or your sister. So there's that aspect. Palestine, Turkey has many operations in Palestine. Also, a tragedy unfolding. Um, there's lots of help going from Turkey to Palestine. Iraq, similarly. So that is also an important dynamic. Then there's the other dynamic, which, has not, uh, which is quite different from these other ones, and I, th I, call that, um, I called it in my research the common fate um, dynamic. Uh, and the best example is the, the sudden warming up of relations between Greece and Turkey in the late 90s, when there was a massive earthquake in Turkey, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, Greece suddenly reached out across the Aegean Sea and was there to help. And then a year later, unfortunately, they suffered a very large earthquake, and there were many deaths in both instances. Turkey reached out. Um, it, it's this sense that when the worst of the worst happens, much of the competition, the political rhetoric, um, possibly animosity falls to the wayside because only a few hundred kilometers from you, in certain instances right across the border, border, maybe only an hour drive from you, people are dying. And um, reaching out is a, is, is a, I think it's a human um, reaction in these instances. And then politics falls to the wayside. So uh, that's what we witnessed in the common fate um, dynamic. And uh, the relations between Greece and Turkey after this, this earthquake um, mutual uh, assistance suddenly improved dramatically. There's a fifth factor that I think exists, um, and I might be wrong on this. Um, please do challenge me. I think I can call that the uh, Istanbul earthquake multiplier. Istanbul, and I alluded to it in, in, in the prior point, uh, suffered through a massive earthquake, parts of Istanbul, not directly right in the city, but parts of the city too, uh, in 1999. 17,400 died. Some, the, the estimations vary. This is just one, but seems to be accurate. Some say the number is significantly higher. Some say it's a little lower. But 17,000 humans dying in an earthquake. 
Turkey is unfortunately number three when it comes to um, number of citizens that have died in earthquakes. Not natural disasters generally, but earthquakes particularly. We're very earthquake prone. Now this only happened in 1999. Um, that's not such a long time ago. And I think it made a huge impact on the Turkish populations, but also on the state's um, awareness and psyche. It was extremely broadly published because, of course, there have been other earthquakes in Turkey, but you know, many decades ago. We have photos, we have some news coverage, but when it happens on live TV, and it happens in a city like Istanbul, Turkey's largest city, one of the world's largest cities, that impact is there forever. So I think that's been a booster of awareness of suffering and that it needs to be addressed if it's in Turkey or elsewhere. Those are the two main driving reasons, I think, that we can identify for why Turkey and the Turks are the number one supplier of humanitarian aid in the world. About 10 minutes, maybe? Yes. Okay. So where does humanitarian aid fall within the realm of Turkish foreign policy? Humanitarian aid is not a tool of Turkish foreign policy. However, it is a bolster and um, maybe a multiplier of effect when it comes to Turkish foreign policy. Turkey does not supply this humanitarian aid because it wants a foreign policy tool that is nice, bright, shiny, acceptable everywhere. Um, the humanitarian aid doesn't come because the foreign ministry decided that it comes. The humanitarian aid comes because Turkish society has all these reasons to supply it, historic as well as current. But does it have an effect on Turkish foreign policy as a positive impact? Absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. Um, it builds trust. It builds good relations with other governments. And again, some of these governments, some of these countries, you know, Africa, so far away from Turkey. And it builds goodwill, which I think at the end of the day for international relations and for a foreign policy dynamic is one of the most important things that you can have. It's not, sh we shouldn't see Turkish foreign, what I'm trying to say is we shouldn't see humanitarian aid as an investment that Turkish foreign policy makes to get additional yields. As a matter of fact, if we think in numeric terms, because I am the Turkish ambassador here and I do know what my ministry has for an annual budget, I can easily tell you that uh, 8 billion US dollars, if it were purely an investment, and this is for the sort of critics to maybe mull or um, for the particularly ascetic, um, you know, 8, million, 8 billion dollars in, how many of you knew that Turkey was the world's number one supplier of humanitarian aid before reading the synopsis. Anyone? So do you think it was a good investment if we put in $8 billion just to make you aware that Turkey's sort of, it's not, because it's not an investment. It's just a reality. It comes from the social dynamics of Turkey and for the reasons I, I've, I've, um, I've mentioned. My ministry has a, has a budget for 2018 of, um, it's a little under uh, 1 billion US dollars. Had we 8 billion US dollars, there's no end to what we could have done in the sense of building awareness about what we do in the world and this and that. That's not, that's not what we do. That's not, that's not the reason we, we provide this aid. We do have an enterprising and sort of a dynamic foreign policy. We want to be seen, we want to be involved. We have to be for our national interests as well. We have to spread ourselves widely for all the reasons I mentioned at the very outset. You know, we are, we're in the East, we're in the West. There are numerous security challenges that we have. We have a, a domestic, terrorism issue as well, which is bolstered by what's going on in Syria and in Iraq. So yes, we, we have to certainly be active um, as a Turkish foreign ministry, and our foreign policy, I think, reflects that. I have a personal perspective to share, and I'll do that in five minutes, if I may. But I think it's important because, you know, I, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a person who's involved in humanitarian aid professionally directly. I don't work with any of these Turkish institutions, but we worked closely with them as a Turkish foreign ministry. I'll give you a good example, and I think we should come to this one as well, because it's the most recent one. When the most, unfortunate, uh, most recent unfortunate earthquake unfolded in uh, Indonesia, we work hand in hand, of course, with the Turkish institutions that provide the humanitarian aid. I don't know how many um, overflight permissions my embassy had to get 
for the C-130s that were bringing in uh, humanitarian aid to Indonesia to help with the uh, disaster relief there. So the foreign ministry is involved. But again, I'm not, I'm not an expert when it comes to the actual dealings um, of it. But I have personal experience, and I want to share that with you. And some of you might have similar experiences. Some of you may have never been involved in humanitarian aid. And this will be the last point I make. I was um, posted to Azerbaijan, country in, in the Caucasus, uh, from 1999 to 2001. And Azerbaijan, um, about 20% of Azerbaijani territory is occupied by Armenia. They went to war. And um, that displaced about one million Azeris, who are now living as uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons, so refugees in their own country, so to speak. They've lost their own dwellings, and their own territory, and live in other parts in Azerbaijan. They're doing much better now, because Azerbaijan, of course, economically has developed by uh, incredible amounts. But back then, um, it was tough you know, to, to have a million people in a relatively small country, and we understand that. It's tough for us, too, with the 3.6 million Syrians that we have, to, to tend to all their needs. And I went to one of the refugee camps, and that was a life-changing experience for me. It really was, because, um, I mean, the comfort and the security that we live in and that we take for granted as regular citizens of whatever country we're from, when that's taken away, everything disappears. And I had no idea how harsh reality can be until I went to these refugee camps. Life-changing experience for me. And since that day, I believe strongly in, in, in supplying humanitarian aid to anybody who needs it. Race, religion, creed, gender, distance, doesn't matter. Um, I was actually there with a um, convoy of Kızılay, the Turkish Red Crescent, and, and it's fairly close from Turkey. And they were supplying tents, food, m medicine, there were doctors there. And I, you know, that's the time I saw that you can really make a difference between them suffering severely or actually getting by for the next week or two. It's an ongoing process. It has to be maintained continuously. Uh, it's very difficult to do, very expensive to do, and ultimately, of course, there needs to be a political solution to such problems. Different story. That was one experience that changed my out outlook on, on humanitarian aid completely. I visited the tent city for the refugee, well, for the, for the Syrians, that, um, and, and a small percentage of Syrians are in tent cities. Many of them are distributed in Turkish cities and live in normal houses. And um, that's very well maintained, very well managed. And it's inspiring to see you know, humans helping humans. It really is. I know it might sound, again, fluffy, but it really isn't. Believe me, if you've never been involved in some sort of charity work, and I'll leave it at that, if I'm, uh, do go out there and, and just get, let's get out of our comfort zone and just see how it makes you feel. And take a look at how, how, how with so little we can do so much for the unfortunate that are suffering globally, everywhere. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take answers.